some doubt on whether your model will actually work. Yeah. yeah. So it would be an unfair burden on proposition to say you have to design a model which can't be critiqued <coughs> by opposition. So it's not a debate about the mechanics. And generally speaking, that's true of all the debates. It's not about the mechanism. Debates that end up being about the mechanism are very dry and dull debates, and very often are never won by the opposition. Because if all you're arguing is about the how, you're never arguing the why. Okay? So the principles still stand untouched at the end of the debate. So you've got to answer what the debate is about. There might be more than one option, as we've said. Yesterday, in our brainstorming session, we decided the debate this evening might be a debate about the difference between what it means to be a good citizen and what it means to have good governance, and how we define those two different criteria. For us, we decided that a good citizen, a better citizen, was one that was informed, empowered, and responsible. And we said direct democracy feeds all of those three things. On the opposition side, we said, well, good governance is efficient and is able to take decisions that are broad in scope and have a long-term rather than a narrow short-term view. And we think representational democracy feeds those principles better. So it's a different conception of similar arguments in the debate. But if you don't divine, define clearly for yourselves what you think the debate is about, you can't then choose the arguments that feed that idea. Okay? So deciding what the debate is about means that you establish very clearly the team line, you might also hear that called case philosophy. The term I like to use, simply because it's shorter than the other two, is thesis. What is your thesis? What is the thing you are setting out to prove? Okay? The second thing the proposition needs to do is what? I've already mentioned the word a couple of times. It begins with a B. Burden. Burden. You've got to determine what is your burden. Determine what is your burden. Okay? In other words, decide for your team the things you have to prove in order for your side to win that debate. And you know what? Tell the judges what it is. Because judges, and I'll be honest with you, we're not very good. We're a little bit thick. We're quite old. Some of us are hard of hearing. Um, makes it really easy for us when you tell us what your burden is and then do it. And then we don't have to work it out for ourselves, because we're also lazy as well. In fact, we're human beings. It's, not, it's astonishing, I know. But we are built with all the flaws and problems that other human beings have. We think we're better than we are. So your job is to make our job as easy as possible so that we like you. So if you stand up and you tell me very clearly, Mr. Speaker, the burden of the proposition in this debate is to show that through direct democracy we empower, inform and make our citizens more responsible and they are better 
democratic citizens. Brilliant. I can write all that down and I have a nice metric by which to measure your contribution in the debate. You tell me, in effect, how to judge what you're speaking. Okay? Give the judges that metric. Opposition might decide that they want to give a different metric and then the judge has to evaluate those two. That's absolutely fine. But you decide for your team what your burden is and how you should be measured against that. And then at the end of the debate, when you come to do a reply speech, you can say to the judge, we told you, this was our burden. We believe we've met this burden in the following ways. Okay? So determine what is your burden and tell the judge how you're going to fulfill it. Or how you discharge the burden. What do we next want to do as proposition? Argumentation. Could be argumentation. There's more than one right answer now. Definitions. <coughs> definitions. I think definitions possibly before argumentation. Because it's only proposition, really, you get to define key terms. So looking at this evening's debate, what key terms do we think require definition? Yeah, and local, local level. And local level. Those are the two key areas that you need to tell us exactly what you are talking about. Okay? And you can define it in any way you choose, provided that it is natural interpretation of the wording in the motion. There might be one or more than one natural interpretation of wording in the motion. If your interpretation is too narrow, so you're trying to reduce your burden, you will be penalised for it. If you make it too broad and widen your burden, you risk not being able to discharge that burden effectively. Okay? So the natural interpretation of words, don't try and be clever, don't think, oh, well in some ways you could read this as this. Okay? That's happened to me before. We once did a debate about legalising trade in human organs. Okay? Creating a market for human organs. What is that debate about? It's the right to trade human organs. It's not a debate about prostitution. Which is a form of trade dealing in human organs. Okay? But that's not an interpretation that we want to hear. Because it's not something the opposition can reasonably expect you to run. This has happened even in competition, where I once judged a debate that was about protecting the rights of the unborn child. What's the natural interpretation? Saving the unborn child. It's an abortion debate. Yeah. It's not a debate about free university education. Because that is also a right of every child, including unborn children. <laughs> okay? So the further you go away from the natural meaning of the wording, the more likely you are to be penalised for <coughs> unfair setup of the debate. So you define the key terms in a way that is natural and to a degree predictable. That is, your opposition can reasonably be expected to prepare something on the same debate. You don't win debates by being so clever that when you define the motion, the opposition have to throw away their entire case. Okay? That's not fair. And it, your job is to set up the right debate in the first instance. So define key terms that are natural and to a degree predictable. Then we might come on to looking at our argumentation. Okay. Are we missing anything? Arguments. Well, we're going to do argumentation in a second. Model. model. Right. Why don't I necessarily put model in there now? You could choose, decide on your model now. But you could also do it later. And why do I think it might be preferable if you do it later? Because you first focus on the 
like the reason behind why you want to place the motion and then how you practically do it so that it's not a mechanical <coughs> Absolutely right. If you focus on your model before you've discovered your argumentation, there is a risk that you spend too much time trying to create a perfect model. And this happened to a degree to us yesterday in our brainstorming session. The moment we started talking about the model, we were also thinking of how that model would be critiqued. Oh, we can't have that because the opposition will say X, we've got to change this bit. And we can't because the opposition will then say and then, Oh, but that bit won't work because the opposition will say... In your prep time, the majority of your prep time should be about your arguments, not about the model. Okay? Doing your model first risks wasting some of your prep time. It also means that when you come to your argumentation, you may well find other things in your argumentation that mean your model needs amending anyway. I think that you're better off discovering your argumentation first, And only then, yay, yeah, argumentation, only then do you derive your model from your arguments. Okay? Your arguments should tell you what your model should do. So if we look at this evening's debate, one of the things we want in direct democracy is participation. We want lots of people to be involved in our democracy. If we're fulfilling our ideas about informed, empowered citizens who use their vote responsibly, it's essential that they use it at all. So we need them to make sure that our model is something that people can engage with, that it doesn't place too much of a physical burden on them, for example, going to a polling station once a week. So we might think about the way we get them to vote because we've discovered the argument that participation is important. Okay? So in your argumentation, you need to ask yourselves five questions. Or you need to answer five questions. And they all start with the same letter. They're not who and where, right? But similar. Okay. First question. What? What is the issue we are trying to solve or resolve? Now, that could be in the form of a problem for which you're asked to product a solvency, in which case it will be a model or a policy debate. It might be that you're asked to resolve an issue of comparison, that something is more important than another thing, in which case it will be a value debate. Or the issue you're asked to resolve is whether a statement is true or false. So that's where you determine the type of debate that you're dealing with. Okay? What is the issue we need to resolve? Second question. Why? Why does this issue need resolving? Okay, one of the most common debates throughout history for the past couple of hundred years has been the debate about the conflict between security and liberty. Very often, those two principles clash. We think governments should be able to provide security for their people. A government that doesn't do that is probably a failing government. Equally, we think it important that governments are able to safeguard liberties. Now, there is a trade-off between those two. So why does this issue need resolving? Where do these two principles, for example, clash? Or why has this problem occurred in the first place? And why does it need now to be solved? So within that why does this issue need resolving, you might want to put the word now. Okay? Why is it now that you're being asked to do something? There needs to be some sort of imperative that means this is the time that we resolve this. 
particularly when you're introducing some sort of policy. Okay? If you have a policy, why is this important now? Why can we not wait 10 years and see how the situation turns out? Okay? Without some level of argumentation about why now, opposition can say, well, yeah, we agree with everything you say, except right now we have a global economic crisis and nobody's got any money, and in 10 years this might not be a problem. Where's the urgency? Okay? Usually there will be a reason, but it's up to you to discover it in your argumentation. Okay, next one, we're back to a what. And that, what are we going to do? Now that might look as though it's restricted just to policy or model debates. But what are we going to do? But it's not. Because what are we going to do also deals with the question of how do we resolve the conflict between two principles that we hold dear? How are we going to prioritise one over the other? You might not need to give a model, but you might need to give an example of where those two principles have clashed or do clash, and how we have resolved it, or how we didn't resolve it, and why that was bad. Okay? So what are we going to do? If it's a truth debate, that question is slightly less important, okay? Because all you have to do is show, in the vast majority of cases, that your statement is true rather than false. And you can allow for exceptions to that. You can allow for the odd case where your statement isn't true. All right? There is no such thing as an absolute truth. I'm not going to go as far as Hassan Saba, the old man of the mountains, and say nothing is true. Some things are. But there is no such thing as an absolute truth. I'll give you an example of something which people believe to be an absolute truth and is not. Okay, I'm going to write down a statement which I think is unequivocally true that you can't possibly come up with a reasonable objection to. I will give you two minutes. I want everybody to come up with a different objection to my statement. Two minutes, write down an objection. Write down a rebuttal. It proves that sometimes that statement might not be true. I don't think there are any. as I go around and ask everybody for their reason, if somebody gives out your reason, you're going to have to cross it out and write another one. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to get tougher. Okay. Everybody have a reason? Yeah? Okay. Why don't you start us off? Start this end on my left. What's your reason? Um, we are animals, so if it's wrong to kill humans, then it's also wrong killing a cow or a dog. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Do we agree with that? Do we think that's a good objection to my statement? Do you think cows have the same rights as human beings? In some countries, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure you can equate killing a human with killing a cow. Because I think even if you're going to eat the human, then you're on a more different moral level to something you need to be. Removing bad people from society. So, in what ways might we do that? Give me an example. Um, like death penalty. Death penalty. There yeah. you go. 
but broadly removing bad elements from society. Death penalty. Okay, that one I can see. Some states think that it's legitimate to take life as a punishment for a crime. Okay, the consequence for you. Can you give me an example? Okay, so a utilitarian perspective, where killing a few people or one person saves a greater number. Okay, John Stuart Mill would nod and say yes. <laughs> <laughs> because our world is crowded and we don't have enough space. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's one from my arguments. <laughs> Population cult. Okay. We used to have disease that did it, but we've become too good at medicine. Yeah. <laughs> so now the population is growing exponentially because not enough people are dying out naturally. We're living beyond yeah, our natural hunger. cycle. More hunger. Yeah. <laughs> Sustainable population for a planet of this size with the resources we have? Probably about 4 billion. We're about 3 billion over that. Yeah. <laughs> but the moment you suggest nuking China, everybody says you're immoral. <laughs> <laughs> Which you probably are, let's be clear. <laughs> okay, that's it. Um, the next one is about DNA evolution. Uh, the only one uh, who will survive this killing will be a very strong man, and uh, it helps with DNA evolution for a whole society. Evolutionary process, yeah. excellent. Maybe one day we'll produce the meta humans that make the X Men real. Yeah. <laughs> That would be awesome! <laughs> <laughs> I'd be more than that. <laughs> Next. Again, uh, it's not moral. It's not moral. It's not moral. But that's a reason why I'm wrong. It's not a reason why I'm wrong. <laughs> I want a reason why I'm wrong. The opposition. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I want you to say this, this statement is wrong. I'll come back to you. Take a couple of moments. Stable to society. Stable society, in what sense? All the like, bad elements or the, what do you say? Uh, well, we've already sort of got that with our death penalty removing bad elements from society. That's exactly what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then you have to think of another one. Next. I had survival of the strongest, but that That's also is voluntary process. So can I skip yep. it and think about it? Self-defense. Self-defense, there you go. The only one that is universally legitimate. Okay? Self-defense is the only form of killing that is universally acknowledged as legitimate. The individual has a right to defend themselves from harm. Brilliant. Uh, stops other people to kill because they are afraid. You mean it's not of, of a death sentence. Ah, we've already got that sort of thing as a deterrent. Although, I'll tell you later on why the death penalty is the worst deterrent ever. <laughs> but, it might be something in there that's linked to self-defense. If we're allowed to defend ourselves, are we allowed to defend our families, for example? Or people close to us? How removed, how far removed from us do people have to be before we have a right to defend them. <laughs> the law says there, have, or the most countries' law says there has to be sufficient proximity between you and the person who is being harmed in order to excuse your action. You can't just jump in and say the stranger. Apparently, maybe you should be allowed to. Uh, okay, I think it's wrong because the definition of word wrong is different from culture to culture. Ah, <laughs> good. Cultural relativism. <laughs> Cultural relativism. What do we mean when we say wrong? Okay? Be careful with issues of cultural relativism, though. Sometimes we can go too far. When Britain shamefully ruled India. Some of the things we did in India were actually quite good. There was a practice in India known as Sufi where the 
woman, if the husband died, would be thrown alive onto the funeral pyre. And if she resisted, she was dragged to kicking and screaming and thrown alive onto a burning fire. And the British Army thought that this was probably a bad thing and should stop. So they decided that they would make Sufi punishable by death. And in the area where it was practiced, one of the tribal elders came to see the British officer in charge and said, you cannot stop us from doing this. This is our culture. This is our tradition. We have practiced this for thousands of years and you will damage our society if you stop us from carrying this out. And the British officer thought for a moment and he said, yes, you're absolutely right. Culture is important. So I will allow you be free to practice your culture. But I must warn you of one thing. I too have a culture. And my culture says when you throw a woman onto a fire, I put a rope around your neck and I pull very sharply on the end until you're dead. So you have the freedom to practice your culture and allow me the same freedom to practice mine. And all of a sudden it wasn't that important to throw these women onto the fire anymore. Okay? So cultural relativism is something that we need to be very, very careful about. Yeah. Okay, um, so I believe that you're wrong because you cannot absolutely define what is wrong. As, um, William Shakespeare wrote in Tragedy of Hamlet, nothing is uh, either good or bad, but our thinking makes it so. Ah, excellent. Nothing is either good or bad, but our thinking makes it so. So it all depends on perspective, is what you're saying. all depends on perspective. What might seem wrong to one person might be perfectly legitimate to another. Okay. Um, so killing people may be uh, right in some cases, such as mercy killing or euthanasia. Euthanasia, I love it. Euthanasia. I'm going to put that right at the top because I think that's my favourite answer so far. <laughs> okay. Euthanasia. It doesn't mean youth in Asia. <laughs> um, in the, uh, killing people, maybe defend your honor in that way. Defend your honor? Yeah. Okay. It works in Albania, if I'm mistaken. Mm -hmm. To defend one's honor. Next. Killing people if your religion asks you to say so. If you interpret it that way. Okay. Religion may demand it. Um, I had killing people at least stated stays in the diseases, which is basically easy. Mercy killing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe killing some people in order to preserve some natural resources or something. Okay, protection of natural resources. Yeah. Those who would destroy them. Rainforests, other animals. Some things are more important, perhaps, than the preservation of human then life. There would be enough water in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said um, that people that have contagious or uncurable diseases that might affect other people. Oh, okay. excellent. I like that. I like that sort of cropping the, or containing the harm, yeah, yeah, so as a form of quarantine, we'll say. Okay? Looking at the bigger picture, but for example, on a general level, killing people is wrong, but if a certain organization country has a uh, good cases bad against their enemy's regime, and we can safely say that if this regime is overthrown, then the killing, other killings will stop, and we can say that we've killed uh, lesser people now, so that more people will die in the future. Cool. Just war theory. Okay? So if you're in a just war, that is a war that is legal and morally imperative to prevent further killing. But killing in war is always accepted. What we give you a death penalty or a life sentence for at home, do it in a uniform, we'll give you a medal. Okay. There's probably only about one more that I can think of off the top of my head. Survival. 
Five of you were shipwrecked. There's no food on the island. Plain here. Yeah. Plain in Andes. Yeah, absolutely. The film Alive, which was about an Argentinian rugby team which crashed in the Andes. And they were forced to eat some of their colleagues. Now I think they chose to eat ones that had already died in the crash. But the but, dilemma in the book yeah, there. Absolutely. At some point, if there are three of you in a boat, and one of you's weak and going to die anyway, why let the meat get diseased? Got to think on a practical level, people. So that illustrates that there's no such thing as an absolute truth, even though we might initially think our statement is strong. So our job as proposition is to determine where attacks will come from on our case. Okay? Because if our case is killing people is wrong, all these are our potential attacks. All these are potential things the opposition could say to refute our statement. So the job of the proposition would be to refine the statement in order to eliminate some of those attacks. Do you understand that? We can add things to our initial statement that eliminate some of those <coughs> questions. Okay? So we can say killing people and we can insert something here. Killing people where it is not for greater benefit. Okay? Killing people where it does not prevent suffering, which would eliminate euthanasia. Killing people outside of legitimate conflicts. Okay? Lots of these are less legitimate than others. Okay? And you can see which ones you would be happier receiving as an attack because you could deflect it very, very easily. Some of them, very, very tough to deal with. Okay? But given that that is almost universally accepted, in legal jurisdictions around the world, it might be something that you can put there. Killing people except in self-defense deals with just war, because just war theory is an issue of self-defense for a nation. It may well deal with death penalty issues. You can argue that the state exercises the death penalty as a form of defense against repeat offenders. And hopefully as a deterrent, but as I've already told you, it's a terrible, terrible deterrent. Okay? It might deal with lots of other things. Self-defense might even cover the killing of people who threaten our natural resources. Because if somebody is going to poison our water supply, then it might be an issue of self-defense. So we can use something that we know is universally accepted, we can modify our original statements and deflect a lot of these attacks. And your job as proposition is to build a case that will withstand those attacks best. What you can't do is build a case where no attack is possible. Okay? Because then you're running a case that is self-proving, that is truistic, and is in a sense undebatable. Okay? So if I were to modify my statement to say, killing people is wrong, except in all these cases, <laughs> then there's, no, there's not much room for opposition to go, because the only one we haven't put up is cannibalism. <laughs> and if that's the only thing opposition have left in their arsenal, I haven't been very fair as the proposition. Do you all understand that? So you need to try and predict to a certain degree what your opponent's going to attack you with, to build fortifications, if you will, prevent those attacks from coming. But you can't do it to the extent that no attack is ever possible. Because that's not legitimate. Okay, what's our final question? We've got two what's, a where and a why. What do we think we need? Who won? <laughs> Who? Yeah. How will we uh, defend our case? Does how begin with a W? <laughs> it does if you spell it incorrectly. <laughs> but then it becomes who? <laughs> or whoa! <laughs> when? And when? When's going to be part of a model along with who? So it's not really a big question that we need to identify. 
Which? Which? No. What time? Yeah. <laughs> what time? Now. <laughs> now you're going to get a little precise about the way. <laughs> this policy works at a quarter past eight on a Monday and none other time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's another why. It's another why. Why is whatever it is we're trying to prove a good thing? Okay? Why is our policy good? Why will it result in better things? Why, when we have direct democracy, will we achieve these citizens who are empowered, informed, and responsible? Why is liberty more important than security overall? What is the abiding good that is contained within there? Okay? So this is essentially where you bring in what we call comparative analysis. Anybody who knows anything about choice theory knows that when people are given options to compare, they are better able to evaluate choices. Okay? If you are presented with one object and asked to determine how good it is, you very often don't have a frame of reference. Asked about two objects, which is more suited to its purpose, the comparison makes the choice much easier. Be careful though. Choice theory can be used against you. Because it's easier to compare things that are similar rather than things that are far apart. Very, very simple experiment that was done by a number of psychology students at the University of Portland was to do with popcorn in a cinema. And they sold popcorn in a small box for $6. And they sold popcorn in a large box for twelve dollars. In the large box, there was twice as much popcorn as in the small box. So there was no real benefit as to which you bought. You got six dollars worth of popcorn or you got twice as much popcorn for twice as much money. What do you think most people did in the cinema? Did they buy the small or the large? The small one. Oh, two small ones. ones. <laughs> most people just bought a small one because they thought twelve dollars was expensive for popcorn. What the psychology students wanted to know was what effect a middle choice would have on people's behaviour. Okay? So they introduced a medium which was exactly in between the small and the large. Did they price it at $9? No. They priced it at $10. What happened? People bought No. People bought the large. Because the small was $6. But that looked really small compared to the other two. The medium was only three quarters of the size of the big, but it was more than three quarters the price. So the large now seemed like the best value for money. Even though proportionally it was still exactly the same as the small. The comparison between the medium and the large was much easier in people's minds for them to make, and it made the small seem very, very small. Everybody looked at it, oh, that's not enough popcorn, and looked at the other two, and there was a clear choice between the other two. So in that way, retailers use things like comparative analysis to push you towards the choice that they want you to make. Okay? Your job as a debater, therefore, is to push me, the judge, towards the choice that you want me to make. Use the psychology that is at your disposal. Remember that your judges are not robots, fortunately. I've seen some judges who act like robots when they come to march your debates, but that's their fault and not yours. Okay? Good comparative analysis, weighing up the other options, showing why the course of action you have chosen is the best, or is most likely to be successful, or will produce, in all likelihood, better results than the contentions of the opposition. Okay? You do on some level, need to deal with those other questions that we talked about, the who, what, where, when, why, how, but those are very, very brief. Okay? If you have a model, you're going to have to say who, because that's your agent. <coughs> you need to say how, but it doesn't need to be a complete picture, it needs to be a suggestion that could work. Okay? In tonight's debate, if you are the proposition, and you'll know this at lunchtime, and you're struggling to think of a model, I would encourage you just to go with online voting. Okay? It's fair for the 
debate as a whole to assume that online voting is fine and safe and secure. Because if we don't have a mechanism that could possibly work, there's no point having the debate about whether it should be done. Okay? The debate about direct democracy is to a degree a policy or a moral debate, but it is also essentially normative. Should we, on a normative level, have direct democracy at local government level? That has to assume that you could practically have it. Because if you can't, there is no debate there. Right? Opposition always wins. Something that we shouldn't bring up, like, for example, on online voting before, should we not just bring it up at all because it's like an attack on the mechanism? Or should we just say it once and do that? You can say, you know, there are historic problems with it, but be prepared for propositions to turn around and go, yeah, we'll just do it better. Because <laughs> <laughs> we have technology people who can do these things. Ultimately, a good proposition will give you examples of where we use online facilities for lots of other things which have security issues. Millions of people around the world are quite happy using online bank accounts and never ever going into a bank anymore. Lots of people are happy making a passport application online and we don't seem to worry about identity fraud on that level. Lots of jurisdictions now use online claims for things like social welfare payments. Again, something where fraud is usually endemic. We haven't seen the fraud increase by a shift to the online realm. So it is possible to do it. But if you spend too much time saying, well, you can't do it online, da, 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 what you're essentially saying is there isn't a model that you can give us that we will accept. But if you spend all your time doing that, then you're not establishing your own principles in opposition or critique. Okay, so who's the agent? How is the suggestion that it could work? What? Again, it's not full details, it's examples. So you don't need to tell me every piece of legislation that would be decided by your direct democracy because that will be dull and I want to stab myself in the ear so I don't have to listen to any more of it. Okay? And that would be a bit extreme, so you don't make me do that. But you could give me examples. You could say, for example, well, we don't think we need to send out an email with a link to a voting server for every single decision every time. We can group them together. We can do half a dozen at a time and send it out once a month, for example, unless there's specific time pressure. But you don't need to give absolutely full details because you haven't got time. You haven't got the tools to do that research. Governments, when they're researching things like this, have teams of people working for months on end to gather the statistical data before forming their model. You haven't got that. You're three high school kids who've got three hours to prepare. So we don't expect forensic detail on that level. So who's going to do it, how are they going to do it, what are they going to do it, and occasionally, when? Occasionally timescales are important. But generally speaking, you don't need to talk about as soon as possible. Yeah, great. That's enough of a way. Right? What is more important to talk about are principles that you believe should be upheld and make those as broad as possible. Okay? Every battle in history has one thing in common. It was fought over common land. The worst wars are the ones where one army turns up at one field and another army turns up at another one. Terrible battle. Never gets started. So there's got to be common ground over which you are fighting. And your job is to put your flag in that ground and say, this land is my land, and you come and take it at your peril. Okay? So if on proposition you stand up and say, we stand for fairness, is that a good principle? Yeah, because it's something both sides should want to fight over. What it's not okay to do is put an unfair burden on your opposition. If you claim fairness, they don't win the debate by claiming unfairness on their side. Okay? There's a very, very wise political theorist who once said, the value of any statement can be calculated by the formation of its antithesis, that is, the opposite statement. If the opposite statement, the antithesis itself, has no value, then neither does the original. 
So when we hear politicians stand up and say, we want to improve living standards for everybody, that's an empty statement. Because the question is how are you going to do it, not the fact that you want to. Your opposition is never going to stand up and say, well, we want lower standards. <laughs> we want more freedom for people. We want less freedom. <laughs> I'm going to vote for the guy who wants lower standards and less freedom. Yay! Sound good. Okay? So don't assume that because you're claiming a principle for your side, the opposite principle falls on the other side. You can both fight over the same principles. But generally speaking, fairness is a good thing. Being nice is good. Remember, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Okay? So be nice to people. Find principles which you are willing to uphold and can uphold with your policy. Okay? Talk about effects and outcomes. Remember yesterday from the structure of argumentation, the effects and outcomes are part of the impact or link back to your thesis. Okay? The fourth stage of any argument. You have your statement, you have your reasoning or theory, you have your examples, which is your real world application, and then you have your impact. Why does this serve our overall thesis? What is the effect of our direct democracy? Well, we think that by being asked to make more decisions that are relevant to them, people will necessarily begin to take more time to gather the required information in order to make those decisions. We think this does two things. It makes campaigning more efficient and more effective, but it also makes the citizenry more receptive to that information. People assimilate more information, and informed decisions are better decisions. Informed citizens, therefore, are better citizens. We link it back to our overall thesis. Principles that should be upheld, effects and outcomes, What's the last thing, or the only other thing that the proposition case needs to do? Conclusion. Mm -hmm. Well, conclusion is more of a sort of a rhetorical device than an actual thing that you need to do. No. We haven't talked about who yet. No. Reference. Yeah. References. No. How many sides are there in the debate? Right. So you've got to talk about what the opposition says as well. Okay? So the last thing for the proposition to consider is deal with the opposition case. Deal with it in terms of refutation, but also in your preparation time. Think about what they're likely to say. Not just as the attack on you, as we did here, where we thought about our argument and we thought about how it might be attacked, but think about what their principled substantive case is going to be. If they're going to argue that direct democracy is inefficient and that representational democracy makes better decisions and quicker decisions and decisions that have a broader scope, how are we going to challenge that idea? How are we going to do what opposition is trying to do to us? Okay? You need to have prepared some of those arguments. Otherwise, you're not going to think of them during the debate. And that includes preparing points of information. Okay. Sometimes called POIs, but that's wrong there. P's are why. Points of information. They need preparing. They are gold in debate. Because really, really good ones take all the power away from the speaker holding the floor. Okay? Really good ones don't get an instant response. They get somebody going, ah. <laughs> uh, I don't really know how to answer that. Okay? I can give you an example of when a POI does that. And I was in a debate with a wonderful debate trainer by the name of Lok Wing Fat. Some of you might know him. He's known as the debating monk. He's from Singapore, and he travels Asia mostly for free, giving his time to students like you. He's absolutely brilliant. And he and I did a public debate for some of our students. And the debate was about whether former colonial powers, that's me, should apologize to the countries they've colonized, that's him. And I was proposing that we should 
and he was oppo. <laughs> so it was this nice middle class white boy saying, Britain is horrible and we need you to give all this stuff back. And there was this nice Singaporean chap saying, no, no, it's fine, Britain, we loved you colonising us. <laughs> and Loke, in his speech, decided to make an argument about the fact that colonisation actually brought Singapore a lot of benefits. It gave them a concept of parliamentary democracy. It gave them a civil service and a bureaucratic infrastructure which survives to this day. And Singapore functions incredibly well as a state. It's not particularly liberal in terms of its laws, and it's not particularly democratic. But it does function very well, and most of its citizens report that they are happy. So this was Loke's thesis, this was his argument. I was the first speaker in the debate, he was the last speaker in the debate. My only chance to interact with him was through a point of information. And so I asked him, Loke, if I'm hit by a drunk driver and I'm put in a wheelchair or crippled, but I work really hard to get to the Paralympics and I win a gold medal, should I write a thank you letter to the drunk driver for giving me that opportunity? <laughs> because that's what you're doing to me. We came to your country, we took your resources, we enslaved your people, and now you want to say thank you for the opportunities. And Loke's response was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the debate was over, ladies and gentlemen, and so is this lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.